Holy and righteous Father, we thank you that we are in it to win it. We thank you that we're washed in the blood. We thank you, God, the blood that you shed, the life is in the blood. And I thank you, God, for the wonder-working power of the cross of Christ in and through each one of us. Lord, you're regenerating us. You're quickening, quickening us by your spirit. You said, let these words sink deep. And I thank you for bringing revelation. And I thank you, God, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, there is no other way back to the Father but through you. And Lord, we thank you. All authority, power, and dominion has been given to you, God. And by your stripes and by the work of the cross, Lord, we are liberated. We are set free. God, we are, there's no more addiction. Our diseases are healed. Lord, you give life to our mortal bodies. Lord, you're causing us to uh, be regenerated into an endless life, a new and living way. And I thank you, Lord, for taking us through the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, I, I just want to um, explain yesterday we were talking. Christ, of course, is the door. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's also the door. Anyone else is a thief and a robber. The cross in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, it says the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are dying, those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To those that are being regenerated, the cross is the power of God. But look what else it says in verse 24, chapter 1. Those who are called the Jew, the Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the power of God is the cross and the power of God is Christ. You know, and Christ had one door to make it through and that was the cross. And he said, follow me. So I know he's the door. I know that's how I get in. But he said, follow me. And what did he say in Hebrews Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him. So he's looking at the joy, but what door did he have to go through? But there was nowhere, it, no way into liberating the entire planet and all of us sinners without walking through the cross. I mean, that's just it. And he said, follow me. So I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. He is the door. He's the way. He's the truth, the light. He's everything to us. Our breath, our being himself went through, tasted death for all of us, right? And then he even says, he said, if you're going to be my disciple in Luke 14, 27, he said, you must pick up your cross. And this is probably one of the reasons I was meditating on it last night, why he doesn't have so many disciples. He's got people that are following him and people that are uh, drinking, you know, from the living water. And, um, but, the, but they're in their, their own life. And he said, to be my disciple... I want you to carry your cross. He had 12 disciples. He definitely didn't have a million. But when people say, I want everything you have for me, God, I want your best. I want everything you had planned for me before I come out of my mother's womb. Well, definitely that would be you picking up your cross. <laughs> if you're praying, I want it all. I want everything you have for me. <laughs> there's 
there's no way it's going to be a life without the cross. <laughs> there's, because that is God's best. You want his best. And that is. And it's through the cross we don't always acknowledge it. We don't always understand. The word of the cross is the power of God. The word of the cross. The speaking of the cross. Foolishness to those who are dying. But life victory, freedom, and healing to the to those that are living. And he says in Galatians 2.20, now I, I would tell people, okay, you've made a profession of faith. Now, do you want, his, do you want everything he has for you? Here's, <clears throat> here's your next step. <clears throat> I am crucified crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. And some of you have called me and you've been saying, it is written, I am crucified with Christ. And you're actually getting miracles. You're getting breakthrough. And that's wonderful because he says, I am crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ living in me. The life I'm living now in the flesh, I'm living by faith who in the son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So it's, I'm letting the cross do the work. And yesterday we spent a lot of time talking about the only thing I'm going to boast in is the cross of Christ. That's what Paul said. May it, may it never be that I would boast in anything except for the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And then he goes on and he said, I bear the marks on my body, the brand marks. And so Paul learned a secret. He, he saw the Lord go through the door. He saw Christ going through and liberating and bringing healing and and all dominion the shift the greatest day ever in the entire planet universe is Christ resurrecting resurrecting from the dead and shifting and bringing light and Paul laid hold of it Paul got it he 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 understood it he even called those who were rebellious, who, who didn't walk in, I would say, this deeper revelation. He called them enemies of the cross. When he said they're enemies of the cross in Philippians 3.18, he's really, they were enemies of Christ. But he called them enemies of the cross because they, they didn't want to let the cross do its power because by his stripes, by the work of the cross, we're free. And as we're being regenerated, we are, many things are happening to us and we might not acknowledge it and we might not understand it, but it is the work of the cross working through us. It is, it is doing its work. The, the, you let the, the work of the cross do its work and then you go to another level and the Lord will say, let's go ahead and nail you to it. Let's just go ahead and liberate you from everything in your old life because anything in my old life is going to become my enemy because I'm born again to a new life. Anything I try to hang on to from yesterday will end up working against me. It will end up becoming my fierce enemy because it's the old man. It's the old creation. It's the old Adam, the flesh and the spirit. They war against each other. The flesh says, well, we like it back here in Babylon. We like to indulge. We like to chase things of the world, watch things we shouldn't, hear things we shouldn't. 
But the spirit and the new creation said, no, let's let it go. Let the cross do its power through our life. So I just wanted to explain explain that to you. And it also says in Galatians 5, 24, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. As a young believer, I thought, how do I crucify myself with Christ? It looks like an impossibility, and it would be in my own hands. But what I do, I just pray, Lord, let that be a very real experience for me, that I am crucified with Christ and no longer a slave to the old man, my old life, but a new in the life of God. And when you pray that, I feel that what he did with me, he took me by the hand and he poured out so much love on me, took me into his bridal chamber and he loved me all the way to the cross to make it an experience for me. And I realized it was love that took Christ, love love for his father, love for us, love unto death that drove Christ through the cross into absolute freedom for all of us. And when we say Galatians 2.20, let that be a part of my life, God. I want to experience that. I want to trust you. I want to walk in a total freedom that you're talking about where all the passions, all the old life, is crucified that I have a new life with you. And when that when you pray that prayer, I I feel he rends the heaven over you, pours out so much love, and just loves you all the way through the experience. I believe God the Father w- would love every one of his children to have a touch of that experience where what his son did for us. And I believe I'm I'm speaking by real experience. Yes, I, I wanted to share uh an awake vision that I had years ago that the Lord showed me about this subject and it was so powerful. Um I saw I saw Christ on, on the cross and you know in Ephesians it says and the Father placed us with Christ in the heavenly realm. We were, uh, you know, with him because we were, we were not only crucified with him. The Father sees us as 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 if we did it with him, but we didn't. It was a free gift. But we were crucified with him. We were buried with him, and we were resurrected in him to a whole new life. And baptism is a picture of that, which is really awesome. But I had this vision of Christ on the cross. I get through this. And I was by his side, and I was also on on the cross. And I was looking at him, and he was looking at me, and I had the biggest smile on my face. I mean, it was ear to ear, and I was just glowing. And uh, I had such a feeling of freedom that I could never have imagined. There is freedom. I mean, we pick up our cross and, and, and it's a picture of us carrying that weight and, you know, saying no to the flesh and walking in his ways. But I tell you, on the other side of that, there is a level of freedom and joy and peace that is beyond understanding. So I just wanted to share that it's, you know, we do have to pick up that cross and it's, it's that picture of, of dying to our flesh and walking in the ways of the Lord. But I want to share the other side of that. You know, Jesus said that he was willing to go to the cross for the the joy that was set before him. And we were that joy. But I tell you, there is a joy and there's a, a level of freedom that we can't even imagine that comes with walking in what Karen is 
talking about right now. I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Any fish? Awesome. In, Eph in Ephesians 2.15, it says, By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, all those things that said guilty, 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 guilty. It says, so that in himself, he might make the two into one new man, establishing peace that we might be reconciled, we might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, having put in death to the enmity. So how are we, how are we reconciled back to God? Christ is the door, but without the cross, you're, you're not gonna be reconciled back to God. The cross is a very major, major key. And there's, I feel there's different levels, 30, 60, and 100. But being God's disciple, I want a hundredfold for all of us. I want, it, I want it for all of us. We carry the cross. The cross has great, great power. And then we get to a place in our walk with them where I, I am crucified with Christ. And what did Paul say? The world's crucified to me and I did the world. He attained that place where I believe it's the other side of that the cross, that freedom that, that Vivian tasted. Anyway, so I wanted to share that and thank you, Vivian, for that testimony before we finish our reading um, in Matthew. We're in Matthew 27, right? Reconciled to God the Father through the cross. Through Christ, Christ is the door. But there's there's always so much more when you walk through that door. It's an endless life. Second Corinthians 5.14 If we are out of our mind, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Amen. Thank you. I, I read up to 11, I think, didn't I? Yeah, okay, we'll start at 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, So you are the king of the Jews, and Jesus said, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not offer any answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they have testified? They are testifying against you? And he still did not answer them in regard to even a single charge. So the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the Passover feast, the governor was accustomed to release to the people any prisoner whom they wanted. And at the time they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, who do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For we he knew that it was because of envy that they handed him over. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife came and with, gave him, sent him a message saying, see that you have nothing to do with this righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. And the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. And the governor said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, crucify him. And they said, why? What evil has he done? Yet they kept shouting all the more, saying, crucify him. Now when Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather than a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood, and you yourselves shall see. All the people replied, his blood shall be on us and our children. Actually, this is where we left off. Then he re released Barabbas for them, and having... 
after having Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the government, governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort to him, and they stripped him and put a red cloak on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they spit on him. And the, they took the reed and beat him on the head. And after they mocked him, they took the cloak off him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. As they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named si Simon, whom they compelled to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave him wine mixed with bile to drink. And after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments among themselves by casting lots. Sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. But above his head, they put him in charge. They put up the charge against him, which read, This is the king of the Jews. At that time, two rebels were being crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left. And those passing by were speaking abusively to him, shaking their heads and saying, You are going to destroy the temple. You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are a son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of, the, of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He has trusted in God. Let God rescue him. Now, if he takes pleasure in, if he takes pleasure in him, for he said, I am the son of God, and the rebels who had been crucified with him were also insulting him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani, which that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, said, this man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it in the reed and gave it to him to drink. But the rest of them said, let us see if Elijah comes to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was, was torn in two from top to the bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Also the tombs were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now as for the centurion, and those who were with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the other things that were happening, they became extremely frightened and said, truly this was the Son of God. And many women there were there from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee while caring for him. Many among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and Mary the sons, mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now, when it was evening, a rich man came from Arimathea, named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Jesus took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own tomb, which had been cut in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the, the tomb. Now on the next day, that is the day which is after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and they said, Sir, we remember that when that deceiver was still alive, he said, after three days I am rising. Therefore give orders to the tomb for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his people, his disciples may come and steal him and say to the people he has risen from the dead and from and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know how. And when they went and made the tomb secure with the guard, sealing the stone. He says, come down off that cross. And how love held him on the cross. And how love will take you to the cross. It, it's it's love. It's it's love holding him on that cross. Love for his father, obedience, 
also love for his, his bride. And on this cross, it says when all this is going on in Isaiah 53, it's, it's telling us that he was despised, forsaken, our griefs he bore, he carried our diseases, our sicknesses, our pain, perversity, depravity, um, even national hurts, national, the hurt of the nation right here at the cross, being beaten and whipped and rebuked and bruised and by his wounds. And, and it says, by his stripes, we are healed. We're healed. The greatest day of the universe that he is, that God himself, coming through the virgin, being crucified, shedding his blood, and God inside Christ reconciling the world back to himself, making a way, making a way for us through the cross, through the cross of Christ, back to the Father. And the Lord said, I'm the door. Of course, he's the door but he's going to take you by the hand and lead you to the cross, which is the door to reconciliation through the blood of Christ with the Father. There's no reconciliation with the Father without the blood. Christ is there at the cross shedding his blood for us. And so they're saying, come down, even without nails, he wouldn't have come off that cross. That cross, he was opening up eternity for all of us who believe by faith, children of promise. And then we talked about in verse 45, in sixth hour, three in the afternoon, the sun would have been very brilliant and everything goes dark. The darkness is um, sin and coming upon the Lord. And remember what the scripture tells us, he tasted death. He tasted death for all of us, that we have an endless life, a new and living way. This is the greatest day in the universe that the blood is being shed. Look at all of us, the offspring, the offspring of Christ, the children of God, Something else is happening here in verse 51. The veil of the temple was torn in two. What's happening when he was on the cross? We I read it to you this morning. The letter of the law, everything about the law, the ordinances, the law, everything that said guilty to us, everything that, that declared us guilty, deserving of death, he nailed the letter to the cross that we can boldly come into the throne of grace now. I don't have to go to the priest with a goat or a lamb or a bull and say, I need my sins forgiven. All of us, we can go straight in to the throne of grace. He said, boldly come to the throne of grace in your time of need. But so much happened here that you now, through the blood, have access to God, yourself. And it says here, the, the two, look what's happening. The veil of the temple is torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook. Rocks are splitting. Tombs are being opened. And the bodies of those before Christ who looked, who, who had the revelation, who looked to the Messiah, like we read about in Hebrews 11, they knew God had something better for them. They, it says Moses even, they had revelations of Christ. Uh, Abraham, it says in Galatians, God preached the gospel to Abraham. It says in Hebrews 11 that Moses chose to suffer the reproach of Christ rather than the indulgences 
of life in Egypt. They came out of the tombs after his resurrection, entered the holy city, and appeared to many. What a sign. And who is it that is witnessing all of these things and and shouting out the centurion, the Roman, not the Pharisee. So the Pharisees must have been in shock, though. They had to. They had to really be in with fear of God because of all these things happening on the earth. They had to be like, whoa. But the centurion shouts out, truly, this this was the son of God. And so I, I just think that there's so much that happened here and there's so much that happened through through the cross, through the, through the cross, through the blood, reconciled to my father, entrance into the heavenly places. I can go into the throne. I can drag myself into the throne and weep before the father and say, here I am, God, I, I need help. Boldly come to the throne of grace in your time of need. And, and he sat with the sinners and the tax collectors and the stinky and those that didn't wash their hands and didn't know the religious order. He sat with all of them. And that tells me and opens this way into the throne that I can boldly go, reconcile me back to my father through his cross. Through his cross, I can boldly go into the throne of grace, washed in the blood of the lamb, and cry out for help from the Father. Just an amazing, amazing thing happening right here. And the chief priests and the Pharisees, they're with Pilate. And they're saying, that deceiver said in three days, I'm going to rise again. And don't you think with everything that just happened, they might actually wonder if he's going to? They were just being stubborn, rebellious, and remember, there was a partial hardening put on the Jewish people. They couldn't see because the Gentiles were going to come in. Now, I believe that many, many Jews are being saved today. But we are waiting for, we're always waiting for a larger outpouring in Israel. And he says, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples might come and steal him and say to the people, he's risen from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. Christ crucified. Christ crucified and rose from the dead. That's our, that's our life in God. And I don't want anyone to be um, confused. Christ is the door. He's the way, the truth, and the life. But he says, as soon as you get in the door, if you want to be my disciple, pick up your cross. And then as he takes you into deeper revelation and you get to Galatians, he gives you another opportunity he says, why don't we just crucify you with Christ? Galatians 2.20. But every time we read the account, we get so much more. I mean, there's so many layers of, of victory and, and so many things that, that happen at the cross. It's, it's like every time we read it, the well, here comes the river of God, more revelation and, and more understanding about its amazing, magnificent work in our lives. I mean, I no longer smoke. I no longer drink. This is all the work of the cross, the blood of the lamb. We overcome by the blood of the lamb. You can go as far and as deep as you want in God, but to be his disciple, he had 12 disciples and there was a whole lot of crowds out there. Think about it. And he's God Almighty. He's God Almighty. And he has 12 disciples.
Kieran, I have a question. This is yeah. Matt. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> you're talking about um, uh, picking up our cross to be his disciple. And I, to me, when I hear that, I think it means um, picking up his, our cross. I want to know what, what you think it means. I mean, it, I know we've been saying it here, but like, um, I hear it to be self-sacrifice, like picking up my cross, um, carrying my burden. I hear also, you know, uh, with, without, um, carrying my burden without, um, lashing out at others or doing, um, destructive things. That's what I hear. But a lot of the thing that I do in practice is I cast my burdens on God. I just say, I can't deal with this. You deal with this. So anyway, I'm just kind of um, wondering what you think about what it means to carry our cross. Well, when I hear self, I hear self-sacrifice. So that's um, it yeah, it's, well, he, he paid, he, he's my sacrifice, right? But remember the first scripture I read to you, the word of the cross is the power of God and Christ is the power of God. So when I'm carrying my cross and say someone smashes into my car and the first thing I would have done is the old Karen got out, demanded their name and number and said, I'm going to call my lawyer and call the police. And, and instead of saying, are you okay? I mean, when I'm walking in the spirit, then I have concern for that person that just hit my car. That would be my first and foremost, not let me get my lawyer and I'm coming after you. So it's, it's a different life. It's when I'm carrying my cross, I'm not going to go out and buy a pack of cigarettes because the cross, the blood of the lamb has given me the power that I'm no longer an addict. I'm no longer addicted to, to wine and alcohol. I've let the power of the cross, wonder working power of the blood of the lamb, the cross of Christ do its work in and through me. This is magnificent. The Lord told me as a young believer, I want you to experience the cross. And he wanted me to pray to him, God, I, I want the experience, Galatians 2.20. I want to be crucified on the cross with you. I want to know what that looks like and what, your, what kind of life and what kind of walk that brings me. And so he, what does he do? He rends the heaven. He pours out so much love on you. And then I have the revelation, the love of the father, the love of God drove Christ all the way to the cross. He, he loves me all the way to the cross. And he wants me to experience what, what he experiences. He has a cross for every single believer. My experience was, was very uh, different. I was, I was on a very, very long fast. I really felt that I got to a place in my life that I was alive in the spirit. I believe the spirit was the, the life of God was holding me. And I, he showed me that I can live off the word coming from the mouth of God and what life totally in the spirit looked like. And I got that wonderful, glorious experience that the Lord showed me through the cross, what life looked like totally in the spirit. And so it was a wonderful, glorious moment in my discipleship. And, it's, and it didn't happen in an hour. It, it, he takes you by the hand and there's a walk to the cross. And then he lets you experience the cross and he lets you taste what that resurrection life is like on the other side of it. You know, that's, that's Lord, I, I want you to do it. We can't do it. We can pick up our cross. We can pick up our cross, but it's Christ. It's his power. 
It's his power. It's, it's him. Lord, it's your work. And like you said, Matt, I'm going to, I'm going to surrender my burdens to you. I'm going to pick up my cross and Lord, I want you to take me by the hand and I want you to love me all the way to through that experience, God, of the cross being crucified with Christ. What does that look like? I mean, I think that's one of the greatest prayers you can pray after you've already come through the door. I think it's one of the greatest blessings you, you can pray. Karen, I know uh, Trusser has her hands up, but can I just follow up? I just want to clarify something, and I want you to clarify it for me. Yeah, sure. Um, when I when I was a kid, I thought carrying your cross meant carry your burden. Like you have, like your cross is your burden. Like we have to carry our burden. Um, that was he, yeah really difficult for me. I don't think that's really the right. No, because he said, cast your burdens upon me. Yeah, and exactly. he said, my burden is light. If I'm going to carry my cross, I'm going to deny myself to my old, stinking, fleshy life. I've got a life with God in the spirit, and I've got the old life, the old Adam. See, it's, it's the old Adam and it's the new Adam, life in the spirit. So when I'm carrying my cross, I'm going to deny myself the indulgent. It's not burden. It's just, I'm not going to go to happy hour and have eight beers. I'm, I'm carrying my cross. I'm denying that old stinking flesh that got me in so much trouble, that took me in the way of death that actually my old life was the road to death. And it's life through the spirit, washed in the blood, life in the, in the spirit, and the power of the cross, picking up my cross, not my will, Lord, but yours. I'm not going to go punch that person in the face. Not my will, but yours. I'm going to deny myself. It's, it's not my will, but yours, God. I'm picking up my cross. I'm not going to act out. I'm not going to go and be cruel. Uh, I'm not going to place a judgment there. I'm, I'm carrying my cross. I'm denying myself. But absolutely, I'm not carrying any burden. Because the burdens are all on his shoulders. When you say to God, I, I want Galatians 2.20 in my life. You know what he, he's going to do? He's going to pour out so much love on you. He's going to reveal what joy looks like. And you're going to keep your eye on the joy and the love. And he's going to walk you right through it. Amen. He's going to make it very, very real to you with the same way it was made real to him. The love and the joy. Christ is the door. But when Christ got ready to go to the cross and return to the Father to reconcile us to the Father, and then the Bible says you are reconciled to the Father, right? Through the cross and the blood. But Christ is, of course, the door. Galatians 2.20, it is written, I am crucified with Christ. Holy and righteous Father, we thank you for the word of God. And we thank you, God, that you've written it on our hearts, God, on the tablets of our heart. I ask, Lord, that we bear fruit. Lord, you said, if you want to be my disciple, you must carry your cross. And I thank you, Lord, that we pick up the cross. Your burden is light. But I thank you, Lord, through the power of the cross, we can say no to the things of the world. We can say we can push the plate away through the power of the cross in our lives, God. And I thank you, God, that, Lord, for everything you did for us, that you could empower us, God, to walk in your ways, God, to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And I thank you, God, that our ears are open and our eyes are open. 
In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Favor in the market. Amen. We're in it to win it, people. <laughs> in it to win it. <laughs> and we're going to win it. We're going to win it. We're going to win it. Thank we you. We're on the winning team. We're on the winning team. There's no losers in the kingdom of heaven. Oh. No way. The lamb never loses. And the lamb has overcome. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah.